Good evening and welcome to the League of Women Voters, Massachusetts Senate Candidates Night. My name is Elizabeth Danis and on behalf of the League, I would like to thank the voters of the Plymouth and Norfolk State Senate District, which includes Weymouth, Hingham, Hull, Cohasset, Situate, Norwell, Marshville, and Duxbury for attending this educational evening. I would also like to thank candidate Senator Patrick O'Connor, Katie McBride, and Stephen Gill for participating this evening. We appreciate you taking the time to help voters make informed decisions on election day. Finally, our league would like to thank league member Chris Wilk, who organized this event, and our moderator, Karen Price, who is from the League of Women Voters of Needham. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. We do not support candidates or political parties. However, we do advocate on public policy after research study and consensus. Because of our nonpartisan position, we must adhere to certain <coughs> guidelines when hosting candidate forums. In contested races, we are not allowed to ask questions of a candidate if their opponent is not present. Our moderator may not be a member of our league or a Plymouth or Norfolk County resident. We do not allow any type of outside recording as videos may be edited and not represent the actual proceedings. This <coughs> evening's forum is being recorded by Hingham's local access cable network, Harbor Media, and footage will be available for viewing on their YouTube channel and website. The video will also be available in the Senate seats, eight communities, and a link will be posted on the League of Women Voters Hingham website. We ask that you please silence your cell phones as a courtesy. And now I would like to introduce our <coughs> moderator, Karen Price, who will review the rules. Thank you. <laughs> And welcome everybody, welcome candidates. Um, there aren't too many rules and the candidates are familiar with them. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Questions will begin after the opening statements and responses for, to the questions are one and a half minutes. After the last question is asked, candidates will have a one minute closing statement. Questions will be addressed and answered by all three candidates and the question should not be directed to any one single candidate. <laughs> we obviously won't have time to answer all the questions, but we will do our best to cover as many topics as possible. If you would like to submit a question, uh, please write it clearly on an index card, raise it in your hand, and it will magically be collected. I would ask that you hold your applause until the end of closing statements so we can get to as many questions as possible. So, are we ready for the first question? Or for opening statements, rather? Uh, we're gonna start with Mr. Mr. Gill, then Dr. McBride, and then Senator O'Connor. So, Mr. Gill, two minutes. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you to the uh, League of Women Voters, uh, Hingham Chapter. Uh, thank you, Pat and Katie, for uh, attending the uh, forum here tonight. Thank you all in the audience uh, who came out on this rainy night to sit and listen to uh, uh, to us uh, to tell you a little bit about ourselves and our uh, positions on various issues. My name is Stephen Gill. I'm the independent candidate for state senate. Uh, first, to tell you a little bit about myself. First and foremost, uh, I am a father. I have uh, two girls. Uh, my oldest is a sophomore at the University of West Virginia, uh, where she is studying for her Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, in the major of puppetry. Uh, she assures me this is a lucrative field, and so uh, I'm happy uh, that she's chosen this. Uh, my youngest daughter is a senior in uh, Marshfield High School, uh, and she's going to be looking at her colleges uh, coming up pretty soon as well. Um, 
I am a veteran. I uh, just retired last year after 23 years in the U.S. Navy Judge Advocate General's Corps at the rank of Lieutenant Commander. Um, I am um, also an attorney. Please don't hold that against me. Uh, the, the, uh, I am a, a Marshfield resident. Uh, my family is actually from Hingham. Um, I'm the youngest of nine children, and the majority of my family grew up right down the street in, in Liberty Pole uh, neighborhood down here in Hingham. Uh, I myself uh, grew up in Hull when my family moved to Hull uh, years later. Um, the, uh, oh, I've got 30 seconds left. I better pick this up. Again, Stephen Gill, independent candidate for state senate. 55% uh, of Massachusetts voters are independent, which means we are the majority of registered voters in this state. Uh, time and again, however, we go to the ballot uh, box and we only see uh, one of two choices on the ballot, either a Democrat or Republican. Uh, this year you'll have a chance to see an independent on the ballot, and I hope that you vote for me on November 6th. Or if you get down to your voting places, uh, which is usually the town hall, uh, during the week now that we have now beforehand for early voting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McBride, two minutes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Katie McBride, and I'm the Democrat running for state Senate. I'm a pediatrician, wife, and mom of two amazing kids. I've long been actively involved in the community. I'm a member of the Hingham Democratic Town Committee and an appointed member of the Massport Community Action Committee. I've given numerous free educational talks at the hospital and the library, and I started a Saturday science program with my friend to introduce children to the amazing accomplishments of women in science. Educating and giving to the community are passions for me. I've been endorsed by outstanding influential people like President Obama, Governor Dukakis, and Gina McCarthy, former administrator of the EPA. I've also been endorsed by diverse and nonpartisan groups and unions like Planned Parenthood, Mass Equality, UAW, and MassCop, which is the largest law enforcement union in Massachusetts. I am humbled to receive the support of so many people. I love being a pediatrician. I get to help families every day. I'm honored to be able to listen to their concerns and help solve their problems. But our health care system is a mess, and it is rapidly worsening. Copays and deductibles keep going up. Families and businesses are struggling with this financial burden. Eight years ago, I gave birth to my son, and it was a happy and overwhelming experience. But we soon discovered that he failed his hearing tests. I found myself looking at health care from a different perspective. I am experiencing the struggles with health care from the inside as a mom of a patient and the outside as a physician arguing for care for my families. When my son turned five years old, we got him ready to go to school, and we filled out the mountain of paperwork to enroll him in public school, and we were very excited. But it still took a year and a half for him to get the hearing system that he needed to better hear in schools. We are underfunding our education. Children are our future, and we should be investing in them. I not only hear your concerns, but I share them. There hasn't been a physician in the State Senate since 1936, and I think it's about time we had another one. Thank you. Senator O'Connor. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and for all of you uh, for coming out tonight to this political forum. My name is Patrick O'Connor. For the past two and a half years, I've had the honor and privilege of serving as your state senator. Together, in my opinion, we've made the South Shore in Massachusetts the strongest they've ever been. On the state level, I worked with my colleagues in a bipartisan fashion to grow our economy, turn an $800 million deficit into a $1 billion surplus, create over 110,000 new jobs in the Commonwealth, invest in our children, our veterans, our seniors, our middle class, and our infrastructure. And we put in place a compassionate but aggressive approach to the opioid crisis. Right here on the South Shore, we've seen record level of aid for our schools, police, fire, public works, and infrastructure projects such as the Route 3 Repair Bridge Project, seawalls, beach nourishment, the Fora Bridge are ongoing or have been completed. I've secured funds for a new school, senior centers, adult, dis adult disabled housing right here on the South Shore, libraries, veterans' houses, water infrastructure, and for local projects long delayed or underfunded. They now have a state partner. And most importantly, my office has helped thousands of constituents in need, whether it be help navigating the state process to helping a family find a bed for their loved one that night because they're struggling with the opioid epidemic that we have. When people from this district call my office, they know that they have somebody at the other end of the line who's caring and wants to work as hard as they possibly can to provide a solution to that person's problem. I ask for your vote on November 6th to continue the work that we've done, continue to make Massachusetts and the South Shore the strongest they possibly can, and to provide you the representation you can be, that you, can des that you deserve on Beacon Hill. 
Okay, great, thank you. We're gonna start now with the questions. Um, the first question, we'll start with Dr. McBride. Remember, if you have a question on a card, to just raise your hand and it'll be collected. Question number one, many of our South Shore communities have shorelines and infrastructure that are impacted by sea level rise and related to storm impacts associated with global warming. What do you think is the role of local, state, and federal governments going forward? And especially, what can you do as a state senator? Dr. McBride, one uh, and a half minutes. <laughs> Uh, one and a half minutes to solve the problem. Um, so it's, it's a big problem, right? And it's something that we need to care about and that we should care about now, right? Climate change is real. Um, I believe in science, right? I have de dedicated my life to, to science and understanding it. And I think it's one of those things that we need to bring the scientists who've been studying it for so long in, into the conversation, right? It's not enough to just look at the studies because that's what we need to do. Uh, it's not enough to look at the innovations that they're coming up with because that's what we need to do. Uh, but then we need to implement it. And we need to have people in our state house that uh, you know, care about it, understand what's going on, and start pushing for it, and pushing for it hard. Um, I think we need to have all involvement. So it needs to be local, and it needs to be statewide. Um, it would be nice to have national involvement, too. But you know, we we'll take that as it comes. Uh, as a state senator, that's what I would be doing, right? Uh, is working with all those people so that we can come up with bills and solutions to those problems. There was a great clean energy bill, um, but unfortunately it lost a lot of the really important parts of it. And I think we need to look at the stuff that's missing and make sure that we add it back in there um, because this is a problem that not just affects us, but all future generations. Thank you, Senator O'Connor. Uh, thank you. Uh, working in a bipartisan fashion, we've been able to secure $10 million already in the past two and a half years for coastal infrastructure projects, specifically seawalls. Another $3 million, excuse me, $6 million we were able to secure through the environmental bond bill. When the governor came down and decided to announce the environmental bond bill, which was well over a billion dollars in new investments that's going, that are going to be made directly to our coastal communities and directly to our environment as a whole, he chose Situate as a location, and I was lucky enough to be able to speak uh, when, when he put that forward. We've been able to pass that environmental bond bill as well as the Clean Energy Futures Bill. I've been down to D.C. and lobbied uh, our local representatives for a fairer, more locally based approach to flood insurance and have worked with all the stakeholders from all the communities that I have the privilege of representing to make sure that they know that they have somebody in the state house who day in and day out fights for every single dollar we possibly can bring back to our, com our local communities and also goes up on to Beacon Hill and puts in place uh, a very, in my, in my opinion, thoughtful process of what we can do to combat the rising tides and, and changing climate. And additionally to that, I uh, was able to get a commission through the environmental bond bill that will look at ways to lower the costs of flood insurance, as well as to have the Commonwealth plot out a statewide plan for future resiliency efforts. Thank you. And Mr. Gill. Well, um, there was a uh, study that was undertaken in 2013. It was a tri-town study by the towns of uh, Duxbury, Situate, and uh, Marshfield. And the uh, scientific predictions for our future was uh, within the next 25 years, we're supposed to have uh, one foot of sea level rise here on the South Shore. Uh, this study was five years ago, so five years have come and gone. There's 20 years left uh, for this one uh, foot rise in sea level. Uh, the study goes on to predict uh, you know, upwards of eight feet over the next 50 to 75 years. So there's going to be large portions of our district going to be going underwater. Um, and, you know, we've made a great start with um, uh, the repairs that we're doing to our seawalls. Um, but the, the, um, the real issue here is what is going to be happening uh, when the water comes up to a point where the seawalls just aren't going to be able to hold the water back. Um, other devices that have been used historically, um, weirs, groins, um, and other types of revetment devices are, are, are good. <clears throat> and um, there's, talk, there's talk about an inexpensive route uh, with these wave attenuation devices. Um, but ultimately, water seeks its own level, and uh, we're going to have to take a, a real strong look at this going forward. Uh, I would propose that we do what the island of Nantucket has done, which is implement a land bank, which gives homeowners an opportunity to have their properties bought out 
uh, the land bank is given a right of first refusal and then their property is left for open space. Thank you. Next question, starting with Senator O'Connor. In light of the possible safety concerns regarding the proposed compressor station, are there steps the Commonwealth can take to stop Spectra's efforts? Senator? Yes, uh, I have filed two pieces of legislation, or excuse me, have been able to get past two pieces of legislation in the Massachusetts State Senate that would restrict the location in which any energy company could put any compressor station in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I was disappointed to see that these efforts uh, after passing in the Massachusetts State Senate were not included in a final version of an energy bill that was basically stripped down to anything that was not in the House version of the bill, ne didn't necessarily even have the light of the day in, in that conference committee, which I s had the honor of serving on as the ranking member of the Global Warming uh, and Climate Change Committee. But yes, what we can do is we can do exactly what upstate New York did, which was fight back on a compressor, fight back on a pipeline project and try and get the state to buy in as a credible partner in making sure that we take on this federal preemption. What's going on right now is an absolute tragedy. And Massachusetts, in particular the South Shore, has to be that voice that's going to say that this is something that can't continue to happen, that FERC and all this federal regulation and, f and federal preemption can't just put these things wherever they want them, especially in areas where there's a tremendous amount of children and neighborhoods. And what we can do at the state level is continue to fight this, continue to get legislation, credible legislation that's passed, and hopefully move it forward and bring the state in as a, as a partner in this lawsuit. Because for 12 years as a city councilor, uh, this has been a, a this has been something that's been a focus of mine since the, the three and a half years that it's been brought up. So uh, it, it's something we need to address. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gill. Yeah, this is why it's important uh, for folks to elect if in their local officials someone who's a leader, someone who is not going to, is going to tell you, uh, tell it to you like it is and to not fill you full of false hope. Um, I said um, a few years back that this issue with the compressor station, it's purely preempted by federal law. I mean, the federal law, which mean, preemption is a legal doctrine, it means when the federal government uh, legislates in a particular area, it owns that area, and the states really have no authority to do anything about it. Right now, the federal law allows for this compressor station to, to come in, and we can, you know, the, the, what we need to do would be to work with our um, um, federal senators and uh, congressmen to see what can be done to alter federal law uh, in order to beat back um, this compressor station. Because as it stands right now, state law doesn't matter, and there's not much that your state senator can do. And you need to have a leader who will stand up and tell, tell it to you like it is and not fill you full of false hope. Thank you. And Dr. McBride. So uh, this is a really important issue. Um, uh, this compressor station, which just very briefly is a station that uh, is going to move gas around, and, and they're highly dangerous. And usually they're put in areas in which there are no people around um, because they can explode and they deal with gas. And so there's lots of chemicals that get put in the air uh, that are carcinogenic. They, they cause cancer. Um, so this would be the, the first of its kind being put in such a highly densely populated area and I think that uh, starts a really dangerous precedent uh, that we just don't need to have and that it's a huge health hazard. Uh, so as a physician, I am really concerned about this. And as a person, I'm really concerned about this, right? So um, actually, even before I decided to run, I am a part of a citizens group against this air permitting thing that we I signed in 2017. So this has been something that I've cared about even before running. The first thing that I would like to do um, is get money Money to earmark a uh, permanent air quality monitoring station. So right now they're monitoring the air uh, from Blue Hills. That's a real big problem because as a person who cares about science, that is not an accurate location for our area. And so getting one of those in our area to give us a better idea of what's going on, I think would be helpful in then fighting this because then you have more data to work with, right? You have more facts um, on your side. And then I think you can get more people involved. Thank you. Dr. McBride, I think you don't need to get quite so close. Oh, There's a kind of an, it just happened when I did it too. There's a bit of an echo when you get real close. Okay, question three. Um, we'll start with Mr. Gill. 
the red line problems, which spill over to the commuter trains along portions of the south coast are well known. Are you satisfied with the steps the Commonwealth has taken? And do you think there is more that the state should do to address these issues? Well, yeah, I think that a lot has been done, and I know that uh, we're going to be getting some uh, new and improved um, red line and orange line cars uh, phased in over the next uh, several years. <clears throat> um, you know, the MBTA is and always has been a, a bit of a mess, and um, I know that Governor um, Baker has been doing quite a lot to see what can be done to correct it. Um, I'm looking beyond... Um, mass transportation and looking to the future where I think over the next 20 years um, we're, we're all going to be driving electric cars anyway. So in, in the, you know, the, this idea of pollution that we had in the past with, with gas-powered automobiles is not really going to be an issue. What I think we really need to do, and anybody who's ever driven on Route 3 knows the nightmares on Route 3, is we need to uh, work with our uh, federal legislators, uh, our senators and congressmen, to see about turning, uh, federalizing Route 3 and making it part of the uh, U.S. Uh, interstate system. That way, we could add a third lane, uh, basically from, uh, you know, Derby Street, everyone love the Derby Street drop, all the way down to Plymouth. And the beauty of federalizing it is, is it will be uh, the construction, the maintenance, uh, uh, and repairs will have to be funded with federal uh, highway funds as opposed to uh, state highway funds, and it would be a, 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 a bit of a savings to us. Uh, and so uh, I'm focusing more, less on the uh, public transportation and more on the future of our driving. Thank you. Dr. McBride? Is this better? If yep. I talk, okay, sorry. Um, so I had the uh, honor and privilege of having Governor Dukakis uh, come to an event and, in, in which he spoke. Um, and I, I love this statistic that he gives. I mean, I don't actually love what it's saying, but I love that he gives this all the time. So uh, he said the average speed of the expressway right now is 11 miles per hour. In three years, it's going to go down to six miles per hour. And in three more years after that, it'll go down to three miles per hour. So... That's a huge problem, right? Um, especially since uh, the train doesn't run very well. I'm, you know, a couple of weeks ago, my husband was stuck on the train for two hours or so um, without really any reason. And this happens so frequently. Um, you know, we joke that it's the snow, but, you know, who knows what's the reason? It just keeps happening over and over again. But I think sometimes we're getting a little bit numb to that. So we need to invest, right? I mean, that's what it all boils down to is we need to start investing. The, 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 our train system, uh, we, first of all, uh, Keolis isn't working, so we need to uh, stop privatizing it and get that back. But we really honestly need to invest in it. Um, and the way that we can invest is there's been a couple of ideas thrown out there, um, and I think we need to kind of look at all of them. But one of them I really liked was the fair share amendment that didn't pass as a ballot question, but I think it's something that we definitely need to revisit. Um, and essentially that's saying that people who make over a million dollars per year, after that, there's another 4% tax on whatever you make after a million dollars per year. And honestly, I think that's pretty fair to help invest. Thank you. Senator O'Connor. Uh, thank you. There's no doubt that the current structure of our transportation in Massachusetts is not adequate to meet the needs of our commuters going to work and our students going to schools. But over the next four years, we're going to make $8.4 billion worth of investments. That includes 152 new orange line cars going on board around this time next year and 252 new red line cars. In addition to that, we're expanding our green line into Somerville through federal money that at one point in time was at in critical state that we were able to bring back and now make sure that that investment is going to happen to our system. We have the oldest public uh, transportation system in the entire country. Uh, it needs a lot of work, and it's not, gonna, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And right here on the South Shore, I advocate day in and day out with Keolis or with the MBTA commuter rail system to increase our capacity to understand and prepare for what's going to happen at the full build at a Union Point, which is on the old colony line, to make sure we increase our capacity on the Greenbush line, and also to make sure our ferries are working properly and that during some of the winter storms when uh, – infrastructure broke that we got that quick uh, fix as quickly as possible. So these are some of the things that we are doing, but we are making significant investments to the system. And as we do, I want to make sure that South Shore gets its fair share of, of that money. Thank you. We're going to move on to uh, the fourth question, which is about um, ballot question one and your opinion. 
Um, as you are aware, there was a law proposed by initiative petition, ballot question one, this law would limit how many patients could be assigned to each registered nurse in Massachusetts hospitals and certain other healthcare facilities. What are your thoughts on this initiative and why? And we're starting with Dr. McBride. Um, so first off, uh, healthcare is really complicated. And um, unfortunately, uh, this really complicated issue is now as a ballot question as a yes or no. Um, and the reason for it is um, the nurses have been going to the legislature for years and trying to get a better safety uh, numbers passed and they've been ignored. Um, so then they force it on a ballot question. And that's why we see it is that it's a failure of our legislature to listen to its people. So I will tell you that I am voting yes on this uh, ballot question. And the reason I'm voting yes is because it comes down to safety for me. As a pediatrician, that is my utmost concern is safety. It's what I talk about with my families every time they walk in is how can we make you safer? And this will make you safer, right? The problem is, is money. And that's what a lot of this all boils down to, too, is, is money, um, is where we're going to get it. And this is why I think we need to have a physician in our state house, is because I work in this field. I've worked with nurses. I worked in the hospital. Like, I've seen this happen. I know what's concerning about all of this. And I think we need to have that experience when it comes down to how this either ballot question passes, great, then we have to figure out the money and how we can do it in a safe way so that programs don't get closed. And if it doesn't pass, we need to listen to our nurses. We need to make our hospitals safer. And so that I think is really important to have that physician voice in our state house. Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Connor. Uh, thank you. I'm a yes on question one as well. My mother is a NICU nurse up at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Brighton. And in 2014, the legislature came to a compromise with the Massachusetts Nurses Association and put in safe staffing ratios for the intensive care units of two patients to one nurse. And since that point in time, my mother said it's been a godsend in her unit, especially dealing with some of the new challenges that nurses have with the growing opiate epidemic, and especially when it comes down to a premature and, and, and very sick children. So I'm a yes on this, and I agree with Dr. McBride. It's one of those things that if this passes, we need to implement it as smart as we possibly can, similar to what we did with the marijuana legislation. There was a lot of things missing from the marijuana legislation that the legislature had to go in and then later correct. And I believe that this is something that, given the astronomical amount of money that the Health Policy Commission and other organizations that are, in my opinion, unbiased, have put a price tag on this, it's one of those things that we may look at. And on the, on the flip side, we want to make sure that no matter what happens with this question, that there's safe staffing ratios at some point in time that are going to be put in place, and we're going to make sure that none of these hospitals are going to lose some of this, these vital programs that they say they could, use, they could lose should, uh, should this ballot question get put in place. So I think that there is still, despite being a yes or no, compromise to be had on question one. Thank you. Mr. Gill? Well, I mentioned uh, to you in my opening remarks, I'm one of nine children. I have four brothers and four sisters, and one of my sisters is a um, nurse at the uh, Boston City Hospital maternity ward. And what they do there is they tend to uh, these drug-addicted um, infants that are born in their first day on earth, um, addicted to all, all types of opioids and other uh, uh, dangerous drugs. Um, and I've, I've talked to my sister at length about this issue. Uh, I, I would vote no on this uh, question, and the reason being is that um, you know the major problem we're having with our healthcare system right now is the funding, um, and everybody agrees and everybody knows that that's the major issue going forward. Um, the numbers that I've seen um, for the costs for implementation of Question One uh, is in the first year it's going to uh, add one; it's going to cost 1.3 billion dollars for implementation, and then it's going to be 900 million dollars thereafter. And I'm wondering why we want to add these types of health care uh, costs um, when, when, when the cost of health care is the number one problem that we're having. We should be looking to reduce costs as opposed to increase them. Um, I'm a veteran. Uh, I belong to a single-payer health care system. It's called the VA health care system. You've probably heard about all the nightmares that the VA system has. Uh, it's always a bad idea. In my personal experience, I've had a number of problems when the government is trying to uh, tell medical providers how to perform their job, um, it's always a bad idea. Thank you. We're going to turn to ballot question three. 
answer a uh, question will be a little different. If a no vote prevails on question three, which is a referendum that addresses transgender anti-discrimination, would you support legislation to reinstate the repealed law? And we're starting with Senator O'Connor. Yes, I would. Um, I think that this comes down to civil rights. I don't think that civil rights should be on the ballot. I actually have some concerns in general with ballot questions, uh, judging and, and legislating policy here in the Commonwealth. And basically the answer is just yes, it's civil rights. I think it's, it's common sense. But just to give an example of ballot questions not working out well, would be the sheltered English immersion. In 2002, a billionaire went around to a specific amount of states and put sheltered English immersion as how you educate English learners uh, as a wedge issue for some candidates that, that that specific billionaire wanted to see get elected. And so the legislature, the, the people went to the ballot box in 2002 and voted for sheltered English immersion. Well, it wasn't until 15 years later that we were able to fix sheltered English immersion after reports came out that 50% of our English learning population wasn't actually learning and they were, they were the highest dropout numbers and the highest unemployed and all of these other specific data points because in 2002, the voters decided to choose how we educate and how we teach English learners rather than academics and folks who have gone through the, the systems before and superintendents, and I was proud to sit, sit on that conference committee in 2017 as the ranking member of education and fix that, because that's some of the things that we risk when we put things to the ballot box, is it's one way or the highway, and that's not how politics works, and it's not how government should work. Everything should be a compromise, and everyone should be, at the end of the day, relatively happy and pleased with the structure of policy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gill, question to you. The, the question is whether you would support reinstating the, uh, the law if the voters vote against it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm actually voting yes on question three. Um, you know, this, um, this country has a um, history um, of local laws being passed to try to discriminate against certain groups of people. And it's wrong, and it's always wrong. And uh, just because someone uh, has a different lifestyle than you or lives differently from you um, doesn't give you the right to judge them and tell them how they should live their life. I mean, this is the United States of America. We're supposed to be the land of the free. Um, I, I can't think of a, uh, <clears throat> more, um, a more human thing than to have to have an opportunity to use a bathroom and to have the government deny you the right to use the toilet, I think is just absurd um i uh you know this this is one of those examples of a um, referendum question that really should not be on the ballot we're talking about people's civil rights we're talking about the equal protection clause uh, the bill of rights and um you know uh, uh, i think we've made great strides in this country moving forward to try to protect um minority groups um, and um, other people's uh, um, civil liberties, and we need to continue that tradition. Thank you. Dr. McBride? Um, so it, it's a really quick and easy answer. So yes, I, uh, support, I would support any legislation that it, it helps uh, the civil rights of all Massachusetts residents because it's something I firmly believe in. And yes, I'm um, voting yes on three um, because, again, I, I believe in civil rights for all Massachusetts residents, all people in general, but definitely here, so yes. Okay, great, next question, starting with Mr. Gill. This is about education funding. The uh, Massachusetts Senate and House both want to add money to the state's education funding formula and have, have identified four key areas of needs, employee health insurance benefits, special education services, needs of low-income students, and English, English language learners. The two bodies are divided on how to address the funding issues. How would you prioritize funding? Yeah, and again, this, this comes down to electing a, 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 someone who's a leader and someone who is willing to uh, sit down and compromise uh, in order to get laws passed. Um, the, um, 
I know that the uh, the problem is Chapter 70 lays out the the, the formula for funding of our um, uh, primary and secondary schools as well as our vo technical schools, which kind of get short shrift, and we need to actually see what we can do to pump up the the vo technical options for kids uh, going going to high school, and then whether they want to go on to college after that. Um, you know, last July the the House. Um, uh, they were supposed to be doing this review. The foundation, the, the FBRC, the Foundation Budget Review Committee, was supposed to be doing this review every four years. And they never did it, and they finally made recommendations in 2014, which were the four points that you just mentioned. Um, House uh, Senate Bill Number 2525 wanted to adopt all four of those changes to the formula immediately. The House Bill 4741 uh, wanted to implement two of them immediately, and they wanted to do a study on the the other two. Um, there was a, the joint committee met this summer, and I know that uh, uh, Pat was on that joint committee. And for some reason, they could not come to a compromise. It, it, the, both bills had been passed unanimously by the House and the Senate, and for some reason, they couldn't uh, come up with a compromise when everybody was in agreement on all the all the um, four points. And it's just a question of which one gets implemented at what time. Um, I think we need to elect leaders who are willing to compromise to get things done. Now what we have is the kids' uh, school funding has been put off for yet another year until it can be resolved at a later date, and everybody suffers. Thank you. Dr. McBride? So I very much support Senator uh, Chang Diaz's bill to revise Chapter 70. Um, I think we need to distribute our resources more equitably across our towns. And I think there's a couple of ways that you can go about uh, getting more resources uh, for doing that. One is we have to fix health care. So one of the big parts on my platform is um, fixing our health care system because it is uh, costing a lot of money and it's it's part of that education is that our health care costs for our teachers keeps going up and that money needs to come from somewhere, right? So fixing health care will have many great benefits for everybody, but it will also help with the education part. The other is where do we get the money from, right? We need more money uh, to put in our education system. And so I think there has been two different uh, ideas about it, and, I, and I've liked both of them, and I think we need to look at both of them. So one is the fair share amendment. Again, that's the amendment that was trying to go as, a, as another ballot question that uh, puts a tax on if you make over a million dollars that you, you pay a little bit more. And I think we need to invest in our children because they're our future workers. So, um, and then the second one is candidate uh, for governor, Jay Gonzalez talked about putting uh, a tax on endowments of a billion uh, dollars or more on some of our universities. Um, so like Harvard and MIT who have billions of dollars of endowments, that there would be a tax on that for them to invest in, our, in all Thank our you. students. Thank you, Senator O'Connor. Uh, thank you. Well, I supported the full recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission and proudly voted in favor of that in the Massachusetts State Senate. And then had the honor of being appointed by a legislative leadership to be one of three members of the Senate to try and negotiate with three members of the House on finding common ground. And the biggest difference was that the Massachusetts State Senate wanted to fund this at 100 percent of what the current local aid figure is would go to economically disadvantaged school districts. So say that school district's getting $5,000 in state aid per student, they would get 10000 That was something that the Senate took a lot of uh, great pride in making sure we got that passed. When we sat down at the table, the House was unwilling to negotiate any number and said that let's have the uh, Department of Secondary and Elementary, Elementary Education pick the number. That was woefully inadequate to us, so over 30-plus hours of negotiations, we were able to finally, after negotiating against ourselves for a period of time, get the House to agree on 70%, so 70% of that 5,000 figure. We then went and tried to uh, finalize everything, and at that point in time, we had lost Senator Chang Diaz, who's, who was the initial author of the bill. She said she would not settle for 70%, and we sat down at the table and said, all right, myself and Sal Domenico, who's from Chelsea, a very economically disadvantaged school district, said, we're willing to sign, we're willing to do this because every single child deserves an education. At that point in time, the House said, we're sorry, we're, we're no longer interested in negotiating. So sometimes things like that happen. Sometimes politics is played at our governmental level. But when a person like me, I try and breach compromise and get things done. And I support the bill. Thank you. Uh, next question, we'll start with Dr. McBride. Um, do you think Massachusetts should adopt laws preventing local law enforcement officers from assisting federal authorities in detaining undocumented immigrants in Massachusetts. Dr. McBride. 
Um, so I support the Safe Communities Act. Um, so basically what the Safe Communities Act is it provides basic protections uh, to immigrants and it allows for communication between marginalized communities and the police. So this helps police uh, by not putting more work on them already um, and it, it helps them with their investigations because witnesses then don't feel uncomfortable coming forward um, and they, ha you know, we know this. This is why when looking at the safe communities, the, one of the things is to not have our local law enforcement be uh, brought into ICE and act as ICE agents. It's because it will make our community less safe and again I'm really about safety that's <laughs> so anything that will help improve the safety of our communities and, and the safety of our lives that's what I'm for so I very much am support of the safe communities amendment or act okay Senator O'Connor we tried to reach compromise on this too during the fiscal year 2019 budget um, unfortunately compromise was not to be had uh, we offered a bill that was supported bipartisanly by Democrats and Republicans. The bill that eventually, or amendment, I should say, that eventually passed was by a strict party line vote. I do not support taking away the ability for law enforcement to engage in 287G agreements. I've spoken with the Plymouth County Sheriff, as well as other specific individuals that have said that the 287G agreements, which is whether they be formal or informal, uh, are, are, are essential to uh, some of the work that our law enforcement needs to do in order to communicate with local law enforcement to take violent people off of our streets. And I'm, I would do nothing um, to specifically say, I would do nothing to prohibit or prevent our law enforcement from doing whatever they possibly could in order to take violent criminals off of our streets. Mr. Gill. Yeah, well, immigration and nationality uh, falls exclusively within the jurisdiction and authority of the federal government. Um, I, uh, I, as a former federal prosecutor myself, I was once I was a uh, special assistant U.S. attorney in the Northern District of Florida, where I prosecuted uh, uh, criminal defendants who were accused of violating uh, federal law. It's always and it's imperative for law enforcement agencies to share information in and amongst themselves. It just makes uh, makes us safer as a whole. I mean, one of the huge criticisms that came out of uh, the whole 9-11 uh, um, situation was the intelligence community's failure to communicate with each other about information that they, that they had. So we have this silo effect of, you know, these d different agencies having information and not sharing it with one another and not being able to act on it. It's the same thing in law enforcement. We need to have our state and local uh, law enforcement um, sharing information with the federal government. Now, if, if, you're, an, if you're an immigrant uh, who has lawfully entered the United States and you have not overstayed the terms of your lawful entry and you have not violated U.S. law, then you, know, you should be afforded all the protections, and you are, of, uh, of U.S. citizens. Um, if if uh, one of these folks is, has entered unlawfully or uh, has committed a, a crime, uh, you know, law enforcement should be able to report them to the federal government and have the federal government deal with it under their exclusive jurisdiction. Thank you. Dr. McBride? Did I? Yeah. You already yeah. did? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> can do it again. No, we got gotcha. you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was busy trying to. Okay. Uh, next question, starting with Senator O'Connor. Um, would you support a graduated income tax or millionaire's tax or something similar? And if so, under what conditions? So I voted. I was the only Republican to vote to put this on the ballot uh, both times that I was able to go to the Constitutional Convention. I spoke the second time, but the first time was actually the first day I was sworn into office. And it was the first vote that I was able to take, which was rather controversial. Um, <laughs> But it goes to show that I'm willing to, to take tough votes and to go against party and to put people first. I think that we need to find additional funding. At that point in time, three years ago when I first, or two and a half years ago when I first voted for this, the state was in an $800 million deficit. We're in a billion dollar surplus now and we're running about $300 million above expectation for this revenue year. I'd have to take a good hard look at this, but I have no problem with the current process of continuing to vote yes to put this to the voters. Uh, which has been something that I've uh, consistently done because it's, it's one of those things where it being a constitutional amendment cannot be done by the legislature and would have to go to the voters. So this is one of those odd circumstances that although most ballot questions 
I think, um, you know, the, the up or down hinders public policy. This is something that would need to be done because it would amend our, our Constitution so the voters would have to do it. Thank you. Mr. Gill? Yeah, I would oppose uh, the penalty tax uh, or the millionaire's tax, as they say, which is essentially a 4% penalty for folks making a million dollars or more a year. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the idea that we're going to penalize people for achieving and, and, and doing better in life just uh, rubs me the wrong way. Um, the idea that just because you make a certain amount of money, uh, you, you are going to be penalized for it. It just seems uh, 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 very un-American to me. Um, we all try to strive to earn more money, and we use our skills to try to um, uh, earn more money for our families and, and for our life. And, and to be penalized for that, just, uh, it just it doesn't, seem, doesn't seem right to me. If you're a sports fan, uh, you can kiss goodbye any more championships because every professional athlete who's going to be trying to wooed here by the various sports teams uh, are going to be looking somewhere else because they're not going to want to pay 4% of their hard-earned income to the state of Massachusetts as a penalty. I mean, a lot of our athletes come from very poor rural areas, and to them, uh, you know, uh, this tax is a heck of a lot of money. Um, and um, I just think it's a bad idea. We should, if we're going to do anything with taxes, it might be a better idea to look at the, the whole flat tax issue if everyone wants to pay their fair share instead of penalizing exceptionalism. Thank you. And uh, Dr. McBride. So, yes, I very much support this. I've brought it up in two, two different talking yes. points already. Um, so I firmly believe that government is how we take care of each other, right? And in order to take care of each other, we need to invest in each other. And that's what taxes are. Taxes are an investment in people. Um, and it's an investment in each other. And I'm proud to pay taxes because I'm proud to give my taxes to educating children and to making the roads work and to giving it to police officers and, and firefighters and, you know, having the government run. I understand the frustration in paying taxes when you feel like your taxes aren't going to where you want them to go or that the train is not running um, and you're paying taxes for it, you know. So I get it. And we need to make our government run better um, because we should really be taking care of each other. And I think if you you make more, uh, you know, you should invest more um, in our communities. You, you ha need educated workers. You need to get those workers' places. Um, and all of that takes money but investment. And that's, how, that's, that's my feeling on it. Great. This is our last question. This is sort of a fun question. I hope you'll enjoy it. <laughs> All fun. What do you mean? <laughs> well, perhaps more fun. Uh, in, in the spring, the Massachusetts legislature passed a civics education bill that lays out specific subjects that schools must teach as part of their civics education. It also requires students to complete a hands-on civics project and creates a program where student volunteers run voter registration drives on their high school campuses. As someone clearly engaged in civics, please describe a hands-on civics project that you would enjoy completing and or a creative program to encourage young people to vote. And we're starting with uh, Mr. Gill. A civics project that I would enjoy being involved in? Or you think a student would enjoy or you would enjoy working with a student on? Well, yeah, I mean, a voter registration drive sounds like a great thing. I mean, um, I, I would like to, uh, you know, go into the schools as an adjunct instructor and, um, you know, share my knowledge, uh, 23 years as an attorney, uh, on, um, you know, legal aspects of uh, how important the U.S. Constitution is and how our, uh, our government actually operates. I, w I would love to uh, be able to go in and uh, be an instructor in that regard. I've done, uh, in the military, I've done a lot of uh, instructions. At one point, I was a, an adjunct instructor at the Defense Institute of International Legal Studies, where I used to have to go around the globe and teach human rights laws to uh, uh, third world nations who the U.S. gives military aid to uh, as a condition of the receipt of their um, of military funds and so forth. Um, I think everyone needs to learn. We can always learn more about how our Constitution works, uh, and it's a living document, and, and, and with the U.S. Supreme Court rulings, it's always changing, and um, it would be nice to, uh, to be able to get a chance to do that. I would, I would love to, uh, to, to be an adjunct teacher in any public school uh, talking about constitutional issues and, and the government and how it runs. Thank you. Dr. McBride? This is a fun question. Um, 
Yeah, no, I, I'm sitting here, my brain's frantically thinking. I, my first thought was that let's have the kids run for office um, because I think we need more diversity in our government. And I love kids' opinions. I love their ideas. I love They're very innovative. Um, and so local office uh, tends to be nonpartisan, and I think that would be a really good thing to have some kids running for office. Um, and so that would be good. Lobbying, I think, is a really great way for for kids to see the state house and to get in there and to know an issue really well and be able to talk to different legislatures uh, le legislators about it. Um, so I would like to maybe see kids uh, more engaged in that's that that aspect. So those are two things. I don't know if they involve PowerPoint or poster boards or, <laughs> or things like that, but that's what I meant. Thank you, Senator O'Connor. Uh, thanks. Over the past two and a half years, I've had a uh, a ton of students contact my office and write to my office, and I always I always write back to them and say, you know, come into the state house, see where the people's house is, see how democracy works. I invite them to sessions. We've had different classes from various of the of the eight towns I represent introduced in the Massachusetts State Senate, whether they be winning awards or athletic competitions. And additionally to that, I try and get out to classes as much as possible and speak to students hands-on and you know, tell them exactly what the world of government is about. We live in a very polarizing time right now, and Massachusetts has to continue to be that standard bearer that needs to stand up in the face of everything that's going on with the partisan divide that we have. And I try to explain that to kids as, as much as I possibly can, that what you see on TV and what you hear about and what you read about in the newspapers is not an accurate representation of what's going on here in Massachusetts. We put our shared priorities ahead of political ideology and we're able to get things done. And being able to go out to classrooms and tell kids that I think is incredibly important because Massachusetts is a lot different and always has been a lot different than other state capitals and and Boston's always been a, a different city and the South Shore has always been a different place than than other areas and it's because we put shared priorities and we put people before partisan divide. Thank you. Um, I said that was the last question but I think there's one question that um, I should uh, add. So let's do one more and um, let's see who will go first. Dr. McBride. Well, Dr. McBride will go first. McBride will go first. If you are elected, what are your top three legislative priorities for the next session? Yeah, Dr. McBride. Yeah, that's a good one to touch on. Um, so, I mean, first and foremost is uh, fixing our healthcare system. Healthcare is is a mess, and it's just rapidly worsening. And so. Um, I would like to ultimately go to a more universal system. Um, you can't do a true universal system in the state, but you can make things better. Um, and so that's what I would really like to, to push for is right now uh, we have a lot of administrative waste that's happening. It's making our health care system really expensive. Uh, our pharmaceutical industry is out of control with um, drug pricing and, and um, medical devices. And so there are ways to go about it to try to in, improve and making it more efficient um, uh, and fair for everybody. So that would be first. Um, second, uh, also lends uh, near to me being a physician, is our opioid crisis. Um, it is something that not only professionally I very much care about, but personally I care about. Um, addiction is really hard uh, to fix, and um, it's very complicated, and you need to make uh, take a multifactorial approach to it. Uh, all at once, just doing it piecemeal is not going to solve the problem. Um, so I would like to bl bring some of my expertise um, into helping solve that. And then third is education. As a pediatrician, I very much care about kids uh, and their development. And not only with the little ones, we're missing out on some prime time of helping them, but our older kids are drowning in debt before they even start their life. Thank you. Senator O'Connor. I would say that education is the number one issue, trying to make sure that we finally fix that funding formula so that every single child has the opportunity to get the best quality of education they possibly can. The second is the opioid epidemic. Uh, this has been something that since I took office 12 years ago as a counselor in the, the town of Weymouth has been something that we've been dealing with. When I became president of the council, I was able to put in place a mental health and substance abuse committee. And since that point in time, we put a very compassionate and aggressive 
approach in place. And the numbers from September 2017 to September 2018 is that overdose deaths are down 90% in the community of Weymouth and overdoses are down 42%. So I want to continue to put that work uh, to, to work on Beacon Hill. And the third is continuing to grow our economy. We see so many strides, not just at the state level, where you look around and you see cranes, crane after crane after crane building new buildings, but you also see it happening right here on the South Shore, where we've invested so much locally that the local economy has grown and expanded, and people are able to create businesses here. And really, the South Shore is, in my opinion, a great place to live, to work, and to raise a family. And that's going to be a key priority is continue to grow our economy, fix our education, and deal with public health crises in order to continue that that great pride we have right here on the South Shore. Thanks. Mr. Gill. Yeah, well, um, like Pat, uh, my number one priority would be uh, education. Um, it seems to me that um, with uh, the both the Senate and the House unanimously adopting the um, four uh, recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission and then not being able to actually hash it out in joint committee to make, <coughs> to put, to pass that into law seems to be a missed opportunity. So. Um, Something I also related to that that I would like to do is I'd like to see us um, put more uh, money into uh, vote technical schools for the kids because um, right now vote tech is traditionally underfunded. Um, I mean, you know, the town of Marshfield doesn't isn't even in the system. Um, it gives kids another chance whether they want to go into the trades or if they ultimately want to go to college, but it just keeps their options open. Um, Second is school safety, which is really to say uh, passage of sensible gun laws. Um, I know that recently Beacon Hill likes to tout the uh, red flag law that they just passed. Uh, unfortunately, it has a giant loophole right in the middle of it where uh, you're able to report uh, someone who's um, dangerous or mentally disturbed who has guns and they'll come and take the guns away. The problem is a loophole allows that person to immediately file an appeal and the day they file the paperwork, they have to give them their guns back. So uh, school safety, and that means sensible gun laws. Uh, third, third is transportation. I already touched on it with the idea of um, uh, trying to federalize Route 3 so that we can put the costs off onto the federal government. Okay, great. It's time for closing statements. One minute each, starting with Senator O'Connor. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the League for hosting us tonight and for all of you for being here. Uh, it's an honor to serve as your state senator. It really is. We've done a lot of great things since taking office, not just the votes that I've taken, but my staff who works tirelessly day in and day out on your behalf. I want to continue to work with Governor Baker and my colleagues in a bipartisan fashion to advance our shared priorities, some of which I touched on, making sure we have great schools for our children and affordable college after that or trades. The best services and programming for our seniors, our veterans, our intellectually and developmentally disabled, making health care more affordable, growing our economy, creating jobs, and making sure that Massachusetts and South Shore's best days are always ahead of us. I ask for your vote on November 6th to continue to work for you and provide you the representation you can be proud of and you deserve on Beacon Hill. Thank you. And Mr. Gill, the last word. The last word. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, your last word. Yeah. <laughs> can we roll back the clock up? I went a little bit out of order, <laughs> but you guys don't mind. Okay. That's fine. Um, you know, uh, we're seeing uh, up in Washington, D.C., and we know it's all very disturbing, this, this development of this political tribalism, and we see the, the members of the, the, the parties are fighting each other like cats and dogs, and, and nothing really seems to get done. Um, you know, the politicians seem to be more interested in hurling personal insults at each other than really working together to, for compromises. This country is built on compromise. It's not my country, it's not your country, it's our country, and we all have different uh, views on uh, how we should uh, be governed. Um, we need to have people, uh, we need to elect leaders who are actually willing to talk to each other and who are willing to sit down and compromise as opposed to just have this my way or the highway approach to governance, which just doesn't work. <clears throat> um, as an independent state senator, I have the advantage of being able to work with both Democrats and Republicans up on Beacon Hill because I'm not their mortal enemy. I'm not a member of that opposing party that, uh, you know, is part of this uh, uh, feud that's that's going on in in, in recent years. Um, uh, please vote for me on uh, November sixth. I see I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Dr. McBride. Very last word. Yes. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I would like you to vote for me because I will bring a new set of skills and a more progressive set of ideas to the state house. As a physician, I care about you and your families. 
I will listen to your concerns and use scientific evidence to help solve our problems. I will work for a more universal health care system. I will attack our opioid epidemic from all angles to help our families and communities. I will work towards high quality, affordable education for all from pre-K through college or trade school and accessible, reliable, and affordable public transportation. I will continue to support our working families, promote gun safety, and defend the civil rights of all Massachusetts residents. I will use scientific evidence to protect our environment. I need you to vote for me, Katie McBride, and together we can write a prescription for change. Thank you. Big round of applause now for all our candidates. Few quick, just a few quick closing remarks. I'd like to thank the candidates for their willingness to participate tonight and you, the audience, for attending. I'm sure you all know Election Day is Tuesday, November 6th, and early voting starts Monday, Yay. October 22nd, and continues through November 2nd. As Elizabeth said, tonight's program will be available to cable television stations in the district as well as online. A quick plug for the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts Voters Guide. It's available and it includes all state, federal, and district candidates and the ballot questions. There's a little card outside with the website, which is informedvoterma.org. So pick one of these up. Thank you again. Good luck to the candidates. And remember to vote because, as we like to say, democracy is not a spectator sport. Thank you and good night.